In this episode of Mind Pump, we are the world's top fitness, health, and entertainment podcast. We blend those all together for a beautiful mix. Um, this episode, we talk about how you can modify your gym workout for your home. Uh, you know, gyms have been closed for a long time in some places uh, due to the current pandemic, and other people are just not wanting to go back to the gym. They're still a little weary of being around that many people, and we totally get it, but fitness is important. Exercise is important. It's important for your physical and mental well-being. And so what we want to do is, is really talk about how you can do your workouts at home, how you can replace popular equipment that you find at the gym at home, all your cable exercises, and even those of you that have uh, just dumbbells. We're going to talk about how to replace barbell exercises with dumbbells and the more difficult ones too, like deadlifts and barbell squats, what you can do with dumbbells That'll get you uh, similar results. Now, before the episode gets going, um, this episode is brought to you by our sponsor, one of our favorite sponsors, Felix Gray. Now, Felix Gray makes stylish blue light blocking glasses. Now, these glasses don't change the color of the room, and they do look good. You don't look like a weirdo, but they do block the blue light that can negatively affect your eyesight and your sleep. Now, these days, people are on screens much more than they ever have been. Being on screen a lot has been shown to potentially be damaging to your eyes, cause headaches, neck tension, uh, to cause issues with focus. Blocking some of that excitable blue light that comes off your screen has been shown to help with that. And you can just wear blue light blocking glasses to do that. Again, Felix Gray makes the best. That's one of the best ones we've ever found. Um, and we have a hookup for you. Go to felixgrayglasses.com. That's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y glasses.com forward slash mind pump. You'll get free shipping and free returns. Also, one last thing, because we're talking about at-home workouts, what we've done with our most popular MAPS workout programs, which include MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, MAPS Aesthetic, MAPS Split, and MAPS Hit, is we've added an at-home workout mod. That means every single exercise that's in those programs that is a barbell exercise or a machine exercise, we've added a replacement with just dumbbells. So now you can follow all the MAPS programs if all you have are a pair of dumbbells. And to celebrate the launch of this mod, uh, we've put all those programs on 50% off sale. So half off all of those. This is a flash sale that ends Friday. It's about 48 hours long. After that, the sale will be over. Here's how you get that 50% off any of those programs. Just go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. That's M-A-P-S, fitnessproducts.com. Use the code at home 50 That's A-T-H-O-M-E-5-0. No space for the discount. And by the way, there's no limit to how many of those programs you can use this code with. So if you get one with the code, it's still valid with the other programs. So if you want, you can get all of them with the same code. Do you guys still get a lot of DMs from people asking about how to modify their workout programs or even just, you know, our programs for uh, home gyms? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a common theme. And I and I think that, uh, you know, based off of like whatever state you're living in or, you know, wherever you're at, like it kind of goes back and forth with whether or not your gym's open or not. Well, we've had, we had, um, they did an article, right? I think we read it on the podcast that, and they surveyed um, a bunch of people that were avid gym goers. They went to the gym two or more times per week consistently, and they surveyed to see how many people uh, would return to the gym um, if things go back to normal, how many people will stay. And surprisingly, even when things get back to normal, that 25% of people are going to remain working at home. Yeah. So there's definitely this surge of mm -hmm. people that, you know, you have a, a large portion are doing it out of necessity, but then there's a large portion of people that are figuring things out and are enjoying working out at home and then are just trying to figure out, okay, I've gone through your Maps Anywhere program. What do I do next? Mm -hmm. You know, how do I how do I make this uh, a, a lifestyle for me? And so I get a lot of DMs regarding this. So I think this is a really good topic to discuss. Yeah, I would say at any uh, more than at any moment in uh – at least in the time that I've been working in the fitness space, this has got to be the, the 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 biggest moment where people really are working out at home. Gyms closed down. I know in some places they're remaining closed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, here in California, they've been closed for a while now. 
Um, and then, like you said, Adam, uh, even when they do open, either because the the regulations require people to have to wear masks and do all this stuff, and I don't know, have you guys tried working out in a mask? It's very difficult. No. Yeah, it's a hard I, thing. I refuse to do. That. It's a hard thing to do because yeah. you're already breathing hard, and then you tend to you know breathe in your own carbon monoxide, or it just feels uh, you know constricting or well, whatever. Well, I told you guys that I saw an article just a few days ago, uh, two kids, in, and I believe it was China, that were wearing a mask that died um, in their PE class. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they were they were running. You know, you get kids do their 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 like uh, mile runs or whatever like that, and they were wearing mask and they actually collapsed and died because of that. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, yeah. you're wow. starting to hear weird Yeah, I don't know how like common that. that is around, you know, I, I think that's probably pretty rare, but nonetheless, it's uncomfortable um, for a lot of people to work out that way. And so yeah. there's that. And then, you, of, course, of course, the fear. People are like, you know, I'd rather stay out of uh, an area where there's going to be lots of people. Yeah. And so people are figuring out, okay, I need to work out at home. So I, I, every every single day I get messages. Mm-hmm. How do I do this exercise without equipment or without barbells or what can I do? You know, this was how I worked out before. I'm not going back to a gym anytime soon. I need to take care of myself. Um, I think a lot of people are realizing the importance of activity, not just for their physical bodies, but for their mental states as well. Um, people are starting to see like, I-, I need to move. Yeah, I think like in terms of the mental state thing, that's why I do think the at home uh, option really makes a lot of sense. Well, I the- mean, it's it's more controllable your environment there, and so you know to be able to organize it in a way where it's going to be effective is really like something we need to kind of help people. With. Well, how did you guys all start? I started in a garage. Oh yeah. Yeah, did you? I, I did. I, I so my. I know you have the back backyard story, right? Yeah, right. my dad owned. Um, he bought a like an Olympic barbell set, but back then that consisted of a bench that was adjustable, and it had a rack on it for bench press. It wasn't a squat rack; it was like a bench press rack. Mm-hmm. And he had um, a pair of adjustable dumbbells uh, and an easy curl bar, which is, I mean, actually quite a bit of equipment, especially back in the, you know, early '90s or whatever. So that's the equipment that I, I was exposed to. And right around the age of 14, you know, through after begging and whatever, I was finally, my dad's parents are like, fine, you have access to it. Go ahead and work out. And that's where I started. And I worked out entirely in my backyard with that equipment uh, probably for about two years until about 16. And then that's when I got my first gym membership, which was a, a, a YMCA. And the YMCA I went to wasn't like it was a full on gym but it was way more equipped um than the now you couldn't even get a gym membership under 16 back in the days unless you had a parent mm-hmm. signature, right? right that's right yeah. that's right and you started wearing a garage yeah I started, was it your garage or? no 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 my friend my friend it's we were you know we were in high school uh we were junior junior summer i believe is when uh we first like really started to get like serious about well i shouldn't even say serious because it was still an afterthought for us it, i we were still heavily focused on uh, playing sports and video games first as number one priority. Number two came like, oh, let's go hit the gym because mm. we all wanted, you know, arms fill out our sleeves, you know, that type of deal. Mm. And we all were smaller, skinny guys. And my one of my good friends, uh, his dad had like a little, you know, universal machine inside uh, his garage and we would get in there and, you know, primarily do arms and benching. You know, that was like what we did for, I think, a good year. And probably like you, a good year to two years. I didn't get my first real gym membership till I was uh, 18 and uh, going to junior college. That's when I got a membership and started working out. And that's probably when I would say I was most serious. I think, you know, at that time I was, I was paying for it myself. And I had another friend who was really serious about lifting and him and I were pretty consistent with going to the gym. And so from that point on, I lifted in a gym uh, very regularly. It it was rare if I ever worked out at a home uh, ever after that until really meeting you guys. Um, You know, both of you were bigger advocates of training from home and and like a, a private type of setup or like what we have here. And now, now that that's happened, I've obviously had gym. I still have three gym memberships. I still pay for all of them. Um, but I, I tend to do more at home working out today than I ever have in my life. And I go back and forth on, uh, what I like, right. Uh, I love the gym atmosphere. I like, um, I like the feeling of other people training really hard around me at the same time. It's, it's motivating for me. I find, mm-hmm. uh, if I drive to a facility and I go work out, I, I'm more accountable uh, to finishing my workout and pushing all the way through because I drove all the way there. That's what you're there for. Right. I'm more likely if I'm at home training 
to put it off or say, oh, I'll wait later. Yeah. But I, but then I've now found that the simplicity uh, of how I train today in comparison to before, you know, I, I was one of those kids who, you know, we wanted to try every machine in the gym. It reminds me like when we travel and the way Sal trains, right? When we go to gyms, <laughs> when we travel, Sal's like, Mr. Try every piece of machinery that's inside the gym. I was like that my whole lifting career. And now since, you know, hanging out with you guys, uh, my programming has changed a lot. And, you know, I stick to a lot of the basic movements and incorporate a lot of mobility. And most of that can all be done at home. Totally. Yeah. And Justin, did you start at, in a home gym or were you, is it sports? The yeah, so, gym? well, yeah, sports. I, I didn't even really like lift weights until probably I was like a freshman. And then, uh, I found my way into the, the gym that they had there. It was real dingy and small, and everybody used it that was an athlete like at the same time. And so you're like fighting for equipment. And uh, I did get a lot of education from the older guys that were in there that that kind of helped kind of show you the technique of a squat and a, a bench press and you know a, a power clean. And so I I was intimidated for sure. And so uh, during the summer we didn't have access to that. So that's where I started to really uh, work with my friend set who he had those old um, sand filled weights and he had that kind of bench set up. And so we tried to do everything possible we could with this one shitty like uh, barbell that had these sand weights. Uh, but, <laughs> I remember those. Yeah. But it was like, it, it worked, you know, it, it, it did the job. It wasn't like super convenient. Um, and we had to get a little bit creative with the way that we kind of lifted with it. Do you remember those with the, like the plastic sleeve of the barbell? Yeah. Yeah. And the, the weights were gray. Yeah, exactly. They yeah. were gray and there was like a little cap that if you pulled it off, the sand would come out. Yeah. 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 Remember that? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Again, and so I had some nostalgia with that, but um, I I fully went into gym mode. Like I much preferred to work out in the gym after that. Uh, and it wasn't until college where it came back where I was just broke and didn't have, you know, I didn't want to like justify spending money for a gym membership. So uh, me and my friends that I was living with at the time, we all went in on a, a set together. And so we had plates and, and a couple dumbbells and that was it. And uh, we worked out the entire summer. And so I, I was able to keep it going and still make like substantial progress when I came back to then, uh, you know, for, for football and for, for camp. So now were you, uh, were you doing like some of the good fundamental lifts back then? Or were you still, were you training like a bro? Like what were you training like? Back then? <laughs> yeah, it was kind of both. Yeah. yeah. I, I definitely broed out uh, quite a bit with the bench and, and uh, I did a lot more curls back then. You know, <laughs> I just, I just kind of eliminated that along, uh, you know, my career, but um, yeah, we did, we did a lot of the the main staple lifts, benching and squatting. We just didn't deadlift as much, which I kind of brought up. We did do like lighter uh, power cleans. And then once I got better and more proficient in power cleans, I started adding like a substantial amount of weight. So I think I got up to like 350 or so, like close to 400 that I could, yeah. uh, you know, kind of squat clean and catch it real low. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean... That that was it. Wasn't until way later that I started to kind of work on deadlifts. So I'm kind of behind. Well, that's, with that. that's a pretty good advantage though, because you train for sports. So you right out the gates, you know, you guys did exercises that were that would provide performance results. Right. Like when I went to the gym uh, for the first time. So I'm 16. I, I this is uh, before I owned a car. Actually, I must have been before I turned 16. I think I did start uh, right before I turned 16. So I didn't have a driver's license. I would ride my bike to the YMCA, and I remember the first day I went in there to work out, I looked at the equipment and I thought, oh, this is gonna, this is it. Like now I'm gonna build all the strength yeah. and all this muscle. <laughs> now I have access to machines. Right. Everything's here. Yeah, I didn't have access before. All I had were barbells and dumbbells. This is the key. And I went in there and that was the focus of my whole routine. And I would use cables and Nautilus equipment and pec deck and mm -hmm. you know machine presses and machine rows and all these different machines. And it wasn't until uh, a group of powerlifters um, who were impressed with my intensity. They were, I could tell they were watching me and impressed with how hard I was doing my leg extensions and leg curls and, <laughs> and hack squats. And they came over to me and they said, hey, you know, you're doing a great job, but if you really want to get strong and get great results, you should just focus on squatting. And I'm like, squatting? I'm like, but look at all these machines. And they, they taught me. They taught me the value mm -hmm. of some of these basic exercises. And um, that was the first... That was the first time I started to kind of really understand that you know a lot of equipment 
doesn't equal uh, great results. In fact, that's a lesson I learned over and over again. Every time I would go to a new gym, because then I, after that, I got a gym at 24 Hour Fitness, which was way more equipped than the YMCA. Again, I fell into that old pattern of using all the machines. Oh, look, there's hammer strength. This is when hammer strength equipment wasn't uh, super popular. I loved hammer strength. And it would, they out. were just starting to introduce it. Doreen Yates, who was Mr. Olympia at the time, you know, they'd show a lot of pictures with them using hammer strength. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, the hammer strength, that's the that's key. That's the thing. That's it. And I would just did all this, this machine type work and it never came close to producing the same results that the traditional, you know, basic home gym exercises yep. would produce in me. And I just, over and over again, I continued to learn that lesson. I learned that with my clients over and over again, where my very first clients as a trainer, I did do a lot of machines. I did do a lot of stuff that seemed safer and easier to use. And uh, when I would have them do the barbell and dumbbell stuff or body weight stuff, uh, the, the, I would just see them progress so much faster. Yeah. And it was just, it kept, you know, it was like a, it was like a lesson. You know, you know how you have to learn a lesson sometimes like 10 times in a row. Mm -hmm. It has to be so obvious that you finally just say, okay, this is, this is it. That's what happened to me when it came to uh, lots of equipment was all this equipment really, really the reason why these gyms have all this equipment is to attract new members. Yeah, it's novelty. It, yes. And it is. It's fun. Like it's fun to to explore all these other ways to lift weights and I think that people are drawn to new experiences and and unfortunately the the fitness industry kind of turned into providing more uh things for the experience of it versus like like straying away from the the real foundational lifts that are were, were producing, you know, the best results and it's it's just how it goes. Like people wanted new stimulus. They wanted new things to attract, uh, you, you know, new customers in. But at the same time, we've, we forgot like what got us. Well, in. here, I'll give you a great example. The, the first gyms that I worked and worked out in had separate, this was a popular thing in the late eighties, early nineties. They would have a women's only area in a gym. This is back when, you know, women were really intimidated by going to a, a, a weight area, a resistance training area. But I remember when they would, you know, this is 24-hour fitness. So back, it was open 24 hours except for on the weekend when they would actually close at midnight or 10 p.m. And I was there all the time. I loved the gym. So I would work as a trainer and I was just there and I'd love closing the gym. I thought it was awesome to walk around an empty gym. And I remember walking into the women's only area and kind of chuckling, not because I thought the women's area was silly, but because it was the same equipment that was out in the regular. Just painted purple. It, yeah. It, it, pink or purple upholstery. Yeah. It was the same machine, <laughs> yeah. except the weight stack maybe didn't go as much, and the yeah. upholstery was it a different. It might have been a little smaller, but yeah. No, it wasn't even that. I remember yeah. thinking that to myself. I look at it and go, this is exactly the same yeah, thing. Yeah, it was the same. And I started to realize, oh, they're just, you know, one of the arguments I get to for lots of equipment is, uh, well, you know, variety is important. You need lots of variety to change the stimulus, to get the body to respond, to continue so to not progress. True. Well, the, the, the variety part is true, but they're, they're doing it wrong. They're saying that you need different machines. Here's the, 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 the truth. There isn't a single machine in the world. Actually, there isn't five machines in the world that doesn't have as much variety as a pair of dumbbells. Mm -hmm. I could do more exercises with a pair of dumbbells than any five machines, any singular use five machines that you can, that you can put together. That's true. I could name a hundred exercises off the top of my head just with a pair of uh, two dumbbells. I can even name uh, probably a hundred with one dumbbell. Um, so the variety argument is actually false. The reason why all this equipment exists is because it attracts customers because the people don't know any better. The simplicity of yeah. it, the ability for you to walk over, look on the side of the machine, it's colored in red what muscle you're working, and then you just do it. You, all a thought process. You're moving it right through this track, yeah. so you don't have to like really like stabilize everything all at once. You can just kind of comfortably sit there and press things, and it feels good. You know, you get a good pump. Yep, yep. I, I have to be honest. I really it wasn't until I was 30, and really when Sal and I first started talking, did I ever fall follow a, a program that was so basic um, and stick to it when he first said that this was before maps was even really public to anybody else. And, uh, and I, and I love, because at that time it was in my late twenties coming into my thirties when this was all kind of coming full circle for me and realizing that, you know, the part that was missing in my training regimen was, was these great compound lifts. And I was beginning to start to introduce them more. And I never had I followed, I still was, you know, 
still doing a majority of machines with intermittently putting these these lifts in that I'm realizing at this late in my career were such game changers. And never had had I actually put together a solid program that looked like anabolic. And that was a game changer for me. And to, even today, like because of those principles, I find myself doing less in the gym and maintaining more results than I ever did in the previous 15 years of my lifting. And it really doesn't take that much equipment. Um, and, it's, you know, it's not sexy. That, and I think that's what it is. Is it's it, it's not you know if you're people yeah. are drawn to novelty, people are drawn to new stuff that you've never seen before, and it's easy and it's hard it, to market it. It is. It really it really is. Well, would you rather have sexy equipment or a sexy body? Right. Yeah. You know that's the truth. Like all this sexy equipment in the world isn't going to produce a sexy body like less equipment but better programming. Do you guys remember when you Pete really put together that programming? was more important than the equipment itself, that how you put exercises together, well, that, how you did the reps, so all that stuff. You, mm -hmm. you talk about this a lot, and, and it's so true. We were always better uh, trainers than we were at training ourselves, right? Oh, so totally. I, train, I train my clients oh, yeah. with the principles in anabolic for a long time. That's what's funny. You know, like they all, they, their programs look similar. I started to piece together probably midway through my career, you know, these, these core movements, these compound foundational type lifts that I built everything around full body type of routines, but yet I was still mm -hmm. falling in the trap of wanting to try all the mm -hmm. toys in the gym and lifting like that all the time. So it's really ironic that it took me later in my career to take a dose of my own medicine. And it wasn't until my late twenties or early thirties that I really start to program myself in my own workouts that way, you know, and it's one of those, you know, shitty moments, right? <laughs> shitty and good at the same time, right? Good because I pieced it together. But looking back, I go like, God, I, uh, you know. Yeah. I it, it's frustrating to think back like, because it was the same. Like I, I would press my body to, to the limits. I always considered like, yes, this is for my clients because they're probably not on, you know, the same level. Yeah, that was uh, it. But I'm all, but I'm going to go all in, you know, I'm going to go for it. And like, you know, I would just, <laughs> just punish myself and just w would stall and not get any more results and uh, didn't even put that together till way later and then you know started to actually listen to all the advice I was already dishing out uh, and that, I think that's just a common problem within trainers. No, I mean th here's the good news for people listening right now that are not working out in gyms, they don't have access to a gym, now they go to work out at home. Your programming or how you organize the the exercises that you have access to, how you organize your workout, how you put everything together, the reps, the sets, the tempo, all that stuff, how you phase it, more important than the fact that you, you know, the lack of equipment that you have or the equipment that you do or don't have, okay? The programming is more important. You could have the best equipment in the world, have terrible programming, get no results. Mm -hmm. You could have no equipment, have great programming, and get phenomenal results. So the good news for people listening right now who don't have access to a gym or don't have access to a lot of equipment, the programming is the most important thing. The access to equipment is not nearly uh, as important. And here's one of the big challenges. Uh, one of the big challenges is we're probably dealing with a lot of people that never really learned how to work out without a lot of equipment, okay? Mm -hmm. A lot of, most people's first real routines were in gyms. Yeah. Now, when you're talking about like heart, like people who are like obsessed about, you know, lifting weights, like I was as a kid or, you know, I started at the age of 14. Sure, that's different. I didn't have access to gym. I figured it out uh, at home first. Most people don't start consistent resistance training at the age of 14. Most people start sometime in their 20s or 30s, um, and they do it in a gym. And so then when you take that away, they're like, what do I do? What do I, I – I don't have all this equipment that I used to use. What kind of a routine do I follow? How do I get good results? Now, I do want to be fair. There, there is one category of equipment that I would say is valuable. In fact, when I owned my personal training studio, which I owned and operated for almost 14 years, um, and I trained lots and lots of clients out of there, the only piece of equipment that I had in there that was not a free weight equipment, so I had barbells, dumbbells, squat rack, was cable uh, machine. Mm -hmm. Cable machines have some value because cables are more like free weights than they are machines. They're, very they're, versatile. They're very versatile. They're free. I can take the cable and move it all kinds of different directions. So the, the place I want to start with is how if you're at home, 
How do you replace cable exercises? Forget all the other machines. Forget the plate-loaded stuff and the selectorized equipment because they're, they're, those really aren't super valuable when you compare them to barbells and dumbbells. But cables, how do we replace cables when you're working at home? Man, I remember. do you guys remember? I remember when the first uh, you know universal cable machine came into our gym. That was, for, as a trainer, like the most amazing tool because I could give – an entire workout, which the universal cable machiners are, are the ones with the arms that, you know, they yeah, pivot. Free motion. Yeah, yeah. Free they pivot all the way to the bottom. They, all these different anchor points um, from all the way to the bottom, all the way to the top and everything in between, which allowed me to basically create a, a entire full body workout in one little station, which mm -hmm. was phenomenal. Not to mention, mention the the benefits of cables because of the the strength curve, right? You, it's different than free weights. With free weights, like you, when you're at the top of an exercise, uh, the resistance is much lower there. Where when you're doing cables, it's consistent through the entire movement, which you know uh, is a great stimulus. But that being said, you know the there's a way to emulate the benefits that you get from cables without cables. Well, the the main the main benefit I would say of cables, the num like by far, right? By far the number one reason why cables are valuable is because you can provide you can create resistance and and you don't need gravity. So what I mean by that, I mean, you are using gravity with the weight stack, but what I mean is I can do a tricep press. Here's a good example. A tricep press down. I can stand straight up, push my arms down, and there's resistance. You can't do that with a free weight because gravity's pushing the weight down. Right. The resistance would make you curl the weight up but not push it down. That's just one example, right? Or I could do a, a standing fly where I'm standing uh, upright and I'm bringing cables across my chest. The only way to do that with dumbbells and barbells would be to lay on my back, for example. Mm -hmm. So it's it's the fact that I can create resistance independent of what how gravity would normally work. Now, the way you replace that um, is with resistance bands. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing about resistance bands. I remember for most of the time I worked in the fitness industry, uh, either most or at least half the time, nobody took bands seriously. Bands were silly. Like, oh, that's for people who don't really, yeah, aren't really like serious. Jazzercise. Yeah, it's not really serious working out. Or that's what you do with physical therapy or... Yeah, those workout videos, you know, that you that you buy, that you do, you, you know, your VCR, you put them in your VCRs back before DVD. Oh yeah, that's you do that, but it doesn't really give you results because you know, who cares? And I know, I remember when that all changed. It all changed when the powerlifting community, yeah, uh, Westside Barbell, they started using bands in their lifts, and they learned these techniques from the the former Soviet Union, you know, Eastern Bloc countries that were so successful. <laughs> At weightlifting, when the when the Iron Curtain came up, when the when the when the Soviet Union collapsed, all this information from these scientists came over across the the, the, the ocean, and we started to learn some of the techniques and the, the methods that they used. And one thing that they did is they used bands quite a bit, and all of a sudden bands went from that's what you know people who aren't serious do to the strongest people in the world use them. Mm -hmm. Let's all start to pay attention. And then bands made their ways into gym, gyms, and then and I remember when that really started happening, and the results clients got from using bands because of the versatility, yeah. um, and then of course uh, something that bands provide, which is very interesting. Adam talked about the strength curve. Bands provide more resistance the further you stretch them out, which makes them unique tools. Yeah. Um, that and you before can that, the options were pretty limited in terms of the actual strength of the resistance. Like you would get bands, but they'd be very thin and you wouldn't really get a whole lot of, uh, you know, weighted resistance that you were fighting. It was pretty weak. Uh, and now they've improved upon them so much to where they have these th really thick bands that, uh, you know, like real, like 400 pound guys could, you know, make a really challenging lift out of it. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, my first experience using a lot of bands in training people was uh, years ago when um, I went to grand open a, 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 24 hour fitness location. This was the club on Santa Teresa. It went through a couple grand openings. They had like a soft grand opening or whatever and the official one. And the soft one was all we had that was actually open was the pool, the basketball court, um, and the free weight area. But the machine and cardio area, or actually the machine area wasn't even open yet. So you had like some free weights, um, some cardio, and that was the equipment that you had access to. So a lot of my trainers were like, hey, you know, what are we going to do? I like doing cable stuff with my clients. So we said, let's just use a lot of bands. 
and let's see what happens. And bands are great because they're versatile as hell and they don't take up a lot of space. You can anchor them. Mm -hmm. If you have a doorway, you essentially have a a limitless amount of anchor points for different exercise, especially if you move your body around those anchor points. And so my, my trainers started training clients with just bands. And I thought what we would have to, what we would encounter was having to explain to clients over and over again, don't worry, the gym's going to open. I know we're just using bands. The reality is the the comments we're getting were, uh, I actually like doing this more than yeah. the than the machines. It's oh, the- I live and died by bands. Mainly once I started to be more mobile in my business uh, in terms of like servicing clients at their house. And one of the most challenging muscle groups uh, to address is the back and especially the lats. Uh, and so if you don't have bands, it's pretty, pretty difficult, uh, you know, to accomplish that. Um, obviously if you have some kind of a, uh, setup where you could do pull-ups and, you know, that's great, but to, to be able to, you can usually find something around the house or outside that you could anchor a band to from the top and you could be in a position where you're seated on the ground, kneeling on the ground, uh, you know, even standing if it's high enough to where we could actually then get some stimulus, uh, from the lats by, you know, doing these types of, of, of lat pull downs or things that you would normally do with cables or, or, or such. So yeah. one of my favorite ways to use bands as, uh, as to use them as assistance for difficult, uh, body weight exercises. So yeah. like right now I, I I'm training my son and my daughter every once in a while will jump in. My son just turned 15. My daughter's uh, 10 years old. Pull-ups and dips are my, uh, too hard for my daughter and my son can't do a lot of them or at least not enough of them to where I can do sets of them over and over again. So he, this is an this is a great thing you could do with bands that is phenomenal is you can use them to assist you on pull-ups. You literally hang them over the bar um, and then step into them or put your knee into them so now that's helping to lift you. And now you essentially have, uh, you can pick the resistance you want to do a pull-up with. Do I want to pull up a lot of my body weight or a little bit of my body weight? So now I got my 10-year-old and I have a strong band around there. She steps into it and she could do, you know, 10 pull-ups and really focus on the form. Same thing with dips. She can do dips now and focus on her form, whereas before the resistance was too heavy and it was an exercise that just wasn't you know, possible for her. Well, that's an example of how you can use bands to assist people, but you can also use bands to make an exercise way more difficult. Like you guys ever used a band for push-ups to make the push-ups more yes. challenging. Yeah, so you could do things like that. You could do things with uh, squats where if you are, you're limited with how much weights you have to make a squat more challenging, you can use bands to do that. So that's what's really, that's what makes bands so versatile is that you can use them to assist lifts that are challenging, like body weight ones, like you're saying right now with the dips and the pull-ups. Or add intensity. Or add intensity to exercises that maybe you don't have enough load for that you can make a lot more challenging without a bunch of extra dumbbells or barbells. I love that. And, and bands don't take up uh, a lot of space at all. I've traveled with bands many times. I, I remember going to Europe once for almost a month. And I almost entirely, my entire workout was consisted of body weight and bands. And I was surprised that I didn't lose uh, strength and muscle um, when I came back. Like Adam talked about the push up, easy. You know, hold the band, put the band around your upper back, put your hands inside of it as an anchor. Now you've got extra resist- resistance with your push up. Here's another way you can use bands you can use bands to, to change an exercise to emphasize certain body parts. So I'll give you, here's a great example, right? So a squat, let's say you do a body weight squat, but you're finding it difficult to activate your glutes. Of course, you can prime properly, you could do a lot of things to help, but here's something you can do. You can attach the band around your waist and put it at an anchor point behind your body. Mm. Now when you squat down, it's not making the squat harder or easier, it's just pulling you back a little bit. So what does that do? When you stand up, you gotta squeeze your glutes to push your hips forward. All of a sudden, you've got a little bit of resistance at the squeeze part of a squat, which normally you wouldn't have at the glutes. This is how I used to teach deadlifting. Mm-hmm. So if I had a client that had a tendency to deadlift, uh, you, you see, when you teach a deadlift, uh, the the brain tends to like operate in the get the weight up off the floor. And the average person looks thinks of a deadlift as just like lifting the bar up off the ground versus hinging from the hips. And one of the best ways to teach someone how to activate the posterior chain, the glutes and the hamstrings to do a, the, the primary uh, movement in the lift of the deadlift is to attach around the waist, anchor it behind them, mm-hmm. 
And then to your point of with squatting, this works really well for coaches on how to teach somebody to deadlift and to really feel it in their butt and their hamstrings when they go to lock out the deadlift, they're squeezing their glutes through. I love that. And it, bands can replace uh, any cable exercise. So any cable exercise that you can do with cables at the gym, you can do with bands. Now, bands... They increase the resistance as you stretch them out. So one thing that I really like with bands is it helps me focus on the squeeze. Like you talk about, I'll give you a good example. Like you talk about a cable crossover, right? And people always talk about how much they love the squeeze of a cable crossover. Yeah. Try that with two heavy bands. The squeeze is the hardest part of the lift. It's the hardest part of that whole movement because you've stretched the bands out even more, and you get an intense connection to the exercise. I love doing that the and then holding that uh, position and really like getting maximizing that squeeze with an isometric, you know, a couple seconds there to really emphasize. Totally. And anchor points again. Uh, bands nowadays they t they can't come with little attachments. You put them in doorways. You could put them around you know p parts of your house that are stable, uh, and you're going to be pretty much set. Um, the next thing that th this is the one where I get the most questions, I think, because uh, you know if you have a barbell, uh, you know, and dumbbell and squat rack set, you're 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 you're, you're, yeah, you're thinking yeah. to yourself, I'm fine, I have everything I need. Pretty much have everything. But what if you don't even? What if you don't have a barbell? Like, what if all you have mm -hmm. are dumbbells and you don't even have a squat rack? You just got a pair of dumbbells and bands. Uh, this can be more challenging for people. So let's talk about how to replace barbell exercises with dumbbells. Yeah, this is very common because think about everybody that lives in an apartment or, you know, is in the city or somewhere. They don't have a lot of access to space in general. Uh, you, you know, you really have to limit your options. And that's where really dumbbells make a lot more sense uh, for a lot of these exercises. And there are certain ways to get around the fact that you don't have a dumbbell, but we can load the body still with dumbbells and perform these types of movement, get the same types of benefits. Yeah. From them. Well, the example that I just gave with a deadlift, like we don't have a, like, it's tough to be uh, to deadlift like good weight mm -hmm. if you don't have good weight or you only have dumbbells. Yeah. But if you take that, and like you guys mentioned before, it's so great how many levels of bands there are. You and To take a very strong band, you wrap it around your waist, and you do a deadlift holding on to some dumbbells. You could be holding on to some 30, 40-pound dumbbells, but then the band is a 50-pounded resistant band. And so that now becomes a really challenging deadlift. Same thing goes for the squat. Yeah. You can't. You don't have a barbell to load and do a really heavy squat, but then you've got a pair of 30-pound dumbbells. Well, you can also do bands wrapped around either your shoulders or wrapped around holding in your hands with the dumbbells and then do a squat that way. And now you've loaded that squat right. a lot for, more. For most of the barbell exercises, the the you know just doing them with dumbbells, it's an easy uh, transition, right? For most of them, not all of them. We'll get to the difficult ones, but most of them it's easy, right? So, okay, bench press with a barbell, almost identical in terms of the form and technique, in you know, with with dumbbells. Now it's a different feel, um, but equally as effective. And some people would even argue more effective, believe it or not, with dumbbells. What about rows, right? Barbell rows. Dumbbell rows, mm -hmm. almost the same kind of movement. There's not much you need to change to do that. Overhead press with the barbell, overhead press with dumbbells, you know, curls. You do curls with dumbbells. It's very, very straightforward to, to transfer barbell exercises to dumbbell for the most part. Well, I'm just uh, reminded of like w when we go back and forth with other uh, different modalities and different strength coaches out there that prefer, uh, you know, different types of programming and they both have legitimate. Uh, like uh, benefits and, and they're focusing on things that are, that are truly valuable, but like, like a Mike Boyle, for instance, where, you know, uh, loading, uh, really going into more of a unilateral type of, uh, of a mode is, is very beneficial uh, for, for athletes, but also everybody in general for, uh, you know, promoting more strength, stability and, and control. And so like using this as an opportunity, if you don't have a barbell to really focus now on, you know, Know, lateral training and strength and, and and support it it makes a massive difference uh you know when you then go back to barbell training when you have access well this is that's a great, another great example right justin because let's say you're somebody who you know is is at home now because of this because of covid and you before could you know squat 300 plus pounds and you're like okay all right adam i'm hearing you but what am i supposed to do grab a pair of you know 
80 pound dumbbells in each hand, still only 160, even with the band, that's still maybe 200. Yeah. Where something. do I put them? Where right. Do I, yeah. But now here you have now try doing that with a Bulgarian squat. You know, yes. you, you do a, a split squat, Bulgarian split squat. Much and you, more challenging. You do that hanging on to 50 or 60 pound dumbbells and you will get an incredible workout. In fact, a lot of people, I end up regressing from a squat into the Bulgarian split squat to get good at that first anyways before I take them to a barbell squat. Yeah, I think the two most challenging barbell exercises for people to replace with dumbbells uh, are your barbell squats and your deadlifts. I mean, pretty much everything else uh, that I can think of off the top of my head is, an, is a straightforward, just switch it to dumbbells. Like yeah. I said, presses, rows, you know, that, all that stuff. But like barbell squats, how do I transfer barbell squats to dumbbells. Well, I think the best way you can do it is exactly what Adam and Justin are saying, which is don't put the dumbbells on your shoulders or your back, although you can do that, by the way. That is one way to to do a squat with dumbbells. But you can also do a Bulgarian split stand squat or lunges, which essentially are single, they're, they're, they're single leg squats. The form mm -hmm. is very similar if you're looking at the front leg. And you get great muscle building results from doing those exercises, they are not weak uh, alternatives. They're actually phenomenal alternatives for a lot of a lot of people. Yeah. A goblet squat. If you want to keep your feet together, try a goblet squat holding a dumbbell and then focus on your form. And if, I would do that. In fact, for a lot of clients, just like you said, Adam, I would take them off a barbell squat. We would do goblet squats for a while to get their form better. Well, to Justin's point, and the shout out to uh, to Boyle. I mean, he's. I mean, revered as one of the best tr trainers, especially athletic trainers that are that are in our field, and mm -hmm. would make the case that it, he would not even do barbell squat whatsoever. And it's yeah. not that I agree that you never need to do it or should do it. It's just that that's how valuable. The Bulgarian split squat is in replace of a barbell squat is some would tout it as better. So it's mm. and it, he has the best track record in terms of keeping athletes healthy out of any coach out there. Right. So it's just you know, and, and you got to take it with a grain of salt. And this is why it kind of goes back and forth, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the nuance of the value of, of barbell versus dumbbell. They both have value. And so it's just a matter of shifting your focus and now focusing because you're limited in access. We focus on bar uh, dumbbells. Right. Now, deadlifts. That's a difficult one, right? How do I, how do I, what do I do instead of deadlifts? Because I had a barbell before. Now I'm stuck with dumbbells. Well, uh, try single leg deadlifts with dumbbells. Yeah. Give that a shot and watch what happens. Now, here's the thing, and you're going to love this, right? Let's say you can pull 400 pounds off the floor. I bet you can't single leg deadlift 200 pounds. You can't do half. Mm -hmm. You'll be lucky if you can do 100 pounds mm -hmm. if you've never done these before. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you there's a lot of room for improvement. In fact, you, will, you should quickly be able to get to yourself to the point where you could do 100, 150. If, let's say you deadlift 400 pounds. You'll get yourself to the point where you could do maybe 150 pounds in your hands doing a single leg deadlift. Then when you go back to your double leg you know, barbell deadlift, watch what happens to your strength and stability. It's pretty incredible. Sumo deadlifts, these are wonderful. You can do these with dumbbells. I used to do these all the time with clients, especially clients who weren't deadlifting three or 400 or 500 pounds. You could do those, those exercises pretty well. So if you just have dumbbells and uh, bands, you're set. No joke. You are pretty much set. I mean, you're okay with just bands, but if you have dumbbells and bands, you're really, really cool. You're really, really well off. Now, here's the next question that I, I always get, which is, how do I progressively overload? You know, so I get this DM all the time. Like, Sal, I'm using the dumbbells. They go up to 30. You know, I'm, I'm getting strong. I need more than 30 pound dumbbells. Do I just do a all million right. and one, you know, reps? Well, I would reference the episode that we did on progressive overload, right? I think we listed eight or nine mm -hmm. different ways. For some reason, when that it's a popular term used in our space, uh, and if you're you're new or newer to fitness, it doesn't quite make sense completely to a lot of people. And then the the easy understanding is, oh, when I keep adding weight to the bar, that's progressively overloading it, right? And that's true. That is. But there's so many other ways to progressively overload the body to see consistent change in the body. And it's not just load. Yeah. There's other ways to challenge the body with, with tempo, yeah, time tempo. under tension, the strength curve that we talked about. There's a lot of, in that episode, we go into real depth about all the different ways. But there's lots of ways that you can continue to challenge yourself without just adding more weight to the bar. Yeah, my favorite way is technique. In fact, these days, uh, when I get stronger in an exercise, I don't add more weight. 
I slow down the, fo- the my tempo and I focus more on the technique, which yeah. ironically We're is what, fine. what we did with our clients. Right? Oh, exactly. Yeah. I never, I was never, I was never eager to just slap. 10 right. I, yeah. As a, as a coach, I was always, uh, I always leaned that direction. Ironically, I didn't with myself, you know, uh, it, you know, I, I ego lifted and, and did everything I coached against myself for many years, but with a client, I was always responsible like that. I shared in a recent episode, if if I put a weight on a bar or on a cable, whatever we were doing, and a client said, oh, that was really easy to get 10 or whatever reps I had them doing, then I wouldn't just, oh, okay, let's add more weight because I I knew the importance of getting the technique down with my clients so well that I would say, no, let's not add load, then let's slow the tempo down. Instead of you pumping out those 10 at the tempo you were, those last three to four, slow it way down and make those 10 reps feel really challenging. That's progressively overloading without adding any more weight. Totally. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'll give you a good example, right? So if I were to guess uh, for myself, you know, how much weight I could lift for 10 reps in a bench press, it would, it would be around 220 something pounds, maybe 220 pounds or 225, right? 10 reps. That's what I could do. And that's me really struggling and pushing and probably going to failure. Could I get myself to feel that level of intensity with 150 pounds on the bar? I could. Mm-hmm. I totally could. I could slow down. I could squeeze could grip my- Grip it harder. Grip it harder. I yeah. could squeeze my chest real hard at the top. I could go down, pause at the bottom, create in- ridiculous tension. And I could make a weight that is you know, uh, far lighter- feel as hard as the heavier weight. Well, this is what you can do if you're limited by the weight of your dumbbells. If you find yourself getting to the point where you're doing more than 20 reps on something and you're like, gosh, I don't want to do 35 reps on every exercise. I'm starting to lose the resistance training benefits. Slow down, focus on the squeeze, focus on the stretch, Mm -hmm. pause the reps, change your technique, go deeper, go lower, and watch what happens to your results. Your body starts to, it responds just like it would if you were progressively overloading with weight. In fact, I would argue in in many cases it might respond better Mm -hmm. because maybe you've never focused on these things before. Oh yeah, if people took the time to really like segment out their lifts and like really focus on the isometric portions where you can build the most strength and the most difficult part of the lift is such an advantage uh, for you going forward. Like that's the the part where you're just recruiting the muscle fibers and you're 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 gaining more access to this force that now you can apply to lifts. Uh, that is part of the strength. That that is something that you're going to carry with you as a new attribute uh, when you go to then you know load more weight. And like you guys said before, even if you need you know actual more intense. Intensity, let's add some bands into the mix as well on top of the dumbbells. And the truth about everything that we're talking about, you know, it, I've been, and I've had a lot of conversations with friends and family and old clients that are like, Adam, what do I do? I'm now home and I have minimal everything, is reframing the situation that you're in. Mm-hmm. You know, instead of looking at it like, oh shit, I can't go to my gym anymore. I'm not going to get as much results. Here's an opportunity for you to put a lot of energy and focus on all these techniques that you were neglecting using before because it was just easy to add weight or it was just easy to go do a different machine because you needed variety or novelty to stimulate more growth or continued results. So instead of, you know, feeling bad or upset or disappointed or frustrated that you don't have access to all these tools, here is an opportunity for you to focus on other aspects or other ways for you to progressively overload the body that doesn't require all these random machines. And so that's been a constant conversation the last two to three months. And before we had created these mods for all these clients that for all of our programs, I'd be getting these DMs like, oh, Adam, I'm in the middle of following aesthetic. What do I do with all these cable exercises? And it's like, it's actually really easy transition. Okay, so Adam just mentioned uh, mods. So here's what we did uh, for our MAPS programs. We have a, a, a bunch of core, we consider our core MAPS programs, right? So MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Aesthetic, uh, MAPS Performance, uh, MAPS Split, our our HIT program, which is high-intensity interval training. Those are all of our like core lifting uh, programs. So what we've done, this is for existing customers and for new, potential new customers or clients, is we've added modifications to all these programs as if all you had were dumbbells. 
Okay, so let's say you, you let's say you follow Maps uh, aesthetic, which is a, a more advanced bodybuilder type routine, right? Every single exercise in there that's not a dumbbell exercise, we have added a replacement that's dumbbells. So now you can follow all these programs, all these Maps programs, and all you need are a pair of dumbbells. And you can do the entire, entire program. And the way we're launching this, because this is all out, and those of you that already have our programs, you are, you've already seen these. They're already in your library. They're in your blueprints. Everything's already there. But the way we're launching this is we're going to offer all those programs and the mods included, the at-home workout mods included, 50% off. Now, those of you that have been with Mind Pump for a long time know that we only ever offer a big, big discount like this, maybe once or twice a year. So this is a big deal. But again, MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, MAPS Aesthetic, MAPS Split, MAPS Hit, all now have at-home uh, workout mods where you just have dumbbells, and they're all available at 50% off. This is a flash sale. It's going to end Friday night at midnight, so I think that gives us, what, 48 hours, Doug? Is that a 48-hour? Somewhere hour? between 48 and 72. Okay, so, so about two to three days. That's it. We don't like to offer these uh, longer than that because we don't like to devalue the programs. But again, we're launching this. Here's how you get those programs if you don't have them. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. That's M-A-P-S-F-I-T-N-E-S-S products.com. And then use the following code to get 50% off. It's at home 50. So that's A-T-H-O-M-E and then five zero. There's no space there. Use that code. You'll get a discount. By the way, there's no limit to how many programs you get. So you can get all of them uh, with that same code. It doesn't expire if you use it once. You can get all of them at 50% off, and they all will come uh, with the mods. So that's it. Look, uh, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. So if you like listening to us in your ears, uh, imagine seeing us with your eyes. Ooh. Check us out on YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast. You can also find us all on social media, on Instagram, uh, Mind Pump Justin, Mind Pump Sal, and Mind Pump Adam. That's where you'll find us. Well, apparently, UFO hunters have seen NASA photos, they're sharing them now, of a, a they're, they're calling an alien cube ship. So it's a dark spot on the moon. No way. It's, I'm looking at the picture right now. It's a dark spot on the moon, but it's a perfect cube, which is weird, because if there's spots on the sun, they're not cubes.